Universitas Indonesia and supported by Universitas Indonesia Student Association and Occupational Safety Community. First of all, I would like to welcome to our below speaker, Dr. Riza Yozia Sunindigyo, Associate Professor at University of New South Wales, Australia, the Honorable Ibu Indri Hapsari Susilawati, SKM MK3 PhD, as Head of Department of Occupational Health Safety, Dr. Dr. Zulkifli Junaidi, Master of Applied Science, as Head of Occupational Health Safety Master Study Program, Dr. Dadan Erwandi, Sarjana Psikologi MSI, as Secretary of Occupational Health Safety Master Study Program, Mufti Wirawan, as Sarjana Psikologi MK3, as moderator for today's event. Our lecturer from Occupational Health Safety Department, welcome to all participants, Occupational Health Safety fellow student, alumni, as well as practitioner from various industry for attending this today's event. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Abdul Qadir. I will be serving as master of ceremony for today's event. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to explain the schedule for today's event. Next slide. The event will be opened by our secretary of master program, Faculty of Public Health, Dr. Dadan Erwandi, and continue with awarding the certificate to the speaker delivered by Ibu Indri Hapsari Susilawati, then opening by moderator by Mas Musti Wirawan, and continue with the speaker session, Dr. Riza, and, and continue with the Q&A session. Ladies and gentlemen, in accordance, in accordance with the Universitas Indonesia requirements, I would like to inform you that for webinar participants who join the online Zoom, please pay attention for the following. Please answer the turn off the microphone and video during the session. And please do not share the screen during the event. And if you have any question, please type your question in the section Q&A with the format for full name and question. And if possible, we would like to allow and invite you to ask directly to the speaker. And don't forget to attend the list can be completed through the link that's sent on the chat box. For the safety reason, I would like to deliver the safety induction for today's event since the seminar have been conducted through the online SME. And according to the Occupational Health Safety Requirement at Universitas Indonesia, we are from Occupational Health Safety Department, Faculty of Public Health Universitas Indonesia will deliver a safety induction. This event has been conducted through Zoom application where all participants join in the home of workspace each so we would like to ask all of you to keep pay attention to the facility or your PC, laptop, or your mobile device. And please, we hope that our participants keep pay attention to ergonomic aspect. So make sure your sitting position are safe during the session. And keep attention to the electrical hazard, such as charger, cable, or switch around you, and you have attended this seminar together. Don't forget to keep your physical distancing. And I would like to recommend to all of you that stay healthy during the COVID pandemic 19 and drink enough water, practice 5M, wearing masks, hand washing, physical distancing, avoid crowded and limit the mobilization. And ladies and gentlemen, before we start our today's event, let us say prayer to get our mic tea so the event can run smoothly. Start praying. Pray over. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Dadan Erwandi, Sarjana Psikologi MSc, as the Secretary of Occupational Health Safety Department, to deliver a speech. Please, Mr. Dadan, time is yours. Thank you, Mas Ading. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, good day, everyone. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Alhamdulillah, today we have an opportunity to take part in discussion today in Invitasi Ilmuwan Diaspora Virtual General Lecture organized by Master Program of Occupational Safety and Health with the theme Health and Safety in the Construction Industry progress and uh, challenges. Uh, it is very grateful to have our collaborator partner for today's session delivered by 
Dr. Riza Yosia Sunandio. Uh, thank you, Pak Riza, from University of New South Wales. It is clear that the demand for occupational health and safety from the society is increasing as an effect of globalization and free trade, especially in the construction field. The implementation of occupational safety and health can encourage more investment injected into the industries in, in Indonesia. According to this to decision, the changing view of safety and health will be important and it will give an insight for several stakeholders in Indonesia. Hopefully, uh, the topic discussed today will give us a new insight and can be implemented in the workplace. We would like to share to all participants that Universitas Indonesia has uh, currently and continually improved the quality both of academic aspect and community engagement by providing supporting fund for achieving international accreditation and academic reputation improvement. One of the program known as Invitasi Ilmuan Diaspora will be oriented at uh, international collaboration development by involving academic staff in exchange science and academic program development collaboration, final assignment tutorial, external exam minor at defend, workshop, workshop and, and so on. Uh, in order to achieve the purpose above, magister program for of occupational safety and health will conduct a uh, various event with our collaborators success uh, virtual general lecture today. In further, uh, I also would like to say grateful to all parties involved, especially uh, the Dean of Faculty of Public Health, uh, Ibu Professor Sabarina, and then uh, Head of Occupational Safety Department, Ibu Indri Hapsari, PhD, Head of Master Program of Occupational Safety and Health, Dr. Kifli Junaidi, alumni, all presenters and com committee, as well as participants who have uh, participated in this today event. Don't forget to participate on our next coming event. Thank you all for being here today and taking the time to patiently listen to the speakers. On behalf of Master Program of Occupational Safety and Health Universitas Indonesia, I would like to say thank you. I wish you all blessed day and enjoy the seminar. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, Mr. Dadan, for great uh, opening speech. For the next, I would like to invite Ibu Indri Hapsari Susilawati, SKM, PhD, to deliver the certificate appreciation to Dr. Riza as speaker for today's. Time is yours, Windri. Thank you, Mas Adi. Uh, Dr. Riza, this is our highly appreciates to have you, Dr. Riza Yosia Sunin Bijo, Associate Professor, Faculty of Wood, Wood Environment, University New South Wales, Australia, as invitasi in Ilmuwan Diaspora Indonesia for Magister of Occupational Health and Safety. As our gratitude appreciation, here it is the e certificate as a symbolic to thank you for your affability as our speaker in virtual general lecture about health and safety in the construction industry, progress and challenges. Thank you so much, Dr. Riza. Many thanks, Ibu. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Indri. And for the next, we're gonna start the presentation, but I would like to invite our moderator and before we start our session today, I would like to uh, uh, read the curriculum vitae from Mr. Mufti Wirawan, Sarjana Psikologi MK3. He is one of the lecturer in the Occupational Health Safety Department, Faculty of Public Health Universitas Indonesia, and with a lot of experience, uh, especially focus on the human factors and behavior in occupational health safety, human error, and accident investigation. He also completed in the certified as assessor of competency from the National Certificacy Profesi or BNSP Indonesia. And he also completed his master's degree in the University in, in Indonesia 
focusing on Magister of Occupational Health Safety and undergraduate program in Universitas Indonesia as well in Bachelor of Psychology. Without any further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Mufti Wirawan. Mr. Mufti Wirawan, time is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Abdul Qadir, uh, for the uh, presentation. And uh, before, so uh, I will uh, say uh, good morning first to the all uh, panelists. Yeah, we have uh, a senior lecturer here, like uh, Prof. Haryoto, and then. Uh, Bapak Dr. Zulkifli Junaidi, Bapak Chandra Satria, Bapak Syahrul Nasri, and then also uh, Ibu Indri as a head of uh, Department of Occupational Health and Safety, and then also Ibu uh, Baiduri, uh, Pak Dadan as a secretary, uh, also Prof. Fatma, Prof. Fatma Lastari as our Uh, professor in our department uh, and, and then Stefan and also uh, Mas Abdul Qadir, uh, Mr. Abdul Qadir. Okay, uh, thank you for your uh, attendance, uh, Bapak Ibu. And then uh, I would like to say uh, welcome to our uh, attendees. We have uh, so many attendees uh, today. And this is a good one. We have around 200 participants. So hopefully, uh, in the next uh, few hours, uh, we I hope we can uh, get an uh, interactive session yeah, with uh, our uh, speaker. And then uh, I would like to say uh, thank you to Dr. Riza. Yoshi Asunin Dijo as our uh, speaker. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your uh, knowledge. Uh, I hope uh, we can get a lot of uh, knowledge and information from your uh, sharing sessions uh, in the next few hours. So I will read the short profile of our uh, speaker. Dr. Reza Yosia Sunindijo. He is associate, associate professor from Faculty of uh, Built Environment, University of New South Wales, Australia. Uh, we can see that uh, his education, his background education, he is from uh, Master of Engineering in ASEAN Institute of Technology, uh, Thailand. And then uh, he continued his uh, study in uh, A PhD program in University of New South Wales uh, with the topic of his thesis is skill for developing safety climate in construction project. And uh, this is one of the topic that uh, interests so many uh, practitioners, I think, in Indonesia, especially in the construction area. And uh, we can see uh, his career. He started as a senior project manager and then uh, also a member of Australian Institute of Building. Uh, he also get a grant from New Colombo Plan or yeah, UNSW Ambassador and then uh, also has a position as a director of postgraduate research in the University of New South Wales uh, from 2018 until now. So uh, I think we can see that uh, Dr. Riza is uh, very uh, competent to uh, deliver the topic about the health and safety in a construction area. And uh, we know that uh, we can get uh, many or uh, we can get much information from, from him. So uh, this is a very big opportunity for us uh, to have uh, Dr. Riza Uh, Yosia Sunindijo. Okay, uh, before we start, maybe I will explain a little about the uh, session. Uh, so, uh, we will have a, a, a session for our speakers, uh, maybe around 45 until 60 minutes. 
and then uh, after that uh, we will have a question and answer sessions uh, until uh, 11:55 uh, according to the uh, rundown that uh, has been uh, filled from uh, Mr. Abdul Kadil before. Uh, for all uh, attendees, uh, I would like uh, to uh, guide you to have your question and uh, question in the Q and A uh, column. Uh, you can find uh, below uh, beside the participant column. So uh, please do not hesitate to uh, bring your question into the column. We will uh, select a uh, question uh, relevant and related to the, our topic, which is health and safety in construction industry, progress and challenge. And uh, beside the attendees, I would ask, uh, also uh, invite our uh, panelists uh, to not hesitate also to uh, ask a question or maybe uh, put the question in the uh, chat column uh, so we can uh, see your question. So I will divide uh, two sessions in the uh, question and answer after the speaker session. Uh, first, we will have a question from a panelist and then after that we will have a question from uh, attendees okay maybe uh, that's for me to uh, guide you through the uh, next session in the next few hours okay <clears throat> so uh, i think that's uh, for me so now uh, we will have a, a presentation session from our speaker uh, dr riza uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Riza and uh, time is yours. Thank you. Many thanks, Pat Mufti, for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me as well uh, to this wonderful uh, session. It's such an honor for me to give or to share my uh, experience uh, on this uh, topic. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so as you can see here uh, today, I will give a presentation on topic about health and safety in the construction industry. So progress and challenges. So I will, uh, I suppose, describe what has been achieved uh, in the past decades or even centuries concerning uh, health and safety in the construction industry, and also introduce some challenges that we still need to uh, focus on so we can improve our performance further. So just a, a quick introduction before I continue with my uh, lecture. Uh, my name is Risa Yusya Sunindio. I'm in the School of Field Environment in UNSW Sydney, the University of New South Wales. So as mentioned earlier, my background is actually in civil before I changed in a sense my uh, education into construction uh, management. I completed my PhD also in UNSW in the, in the area of health and safety in construction. I do have some industry experience uh, as well. So I started as, as a structural engineer because of my educational background in civil, but then I shifted my career uh, to construction uh, management. So I work for Lendlease. Uh, Lendlease is, is currently the, the largest construction company in Australia. And then from there, I moved to Jones Lang uh, LaSalle uh, and I uh, became a senior project manager there. So Jones Lang LaSalle is, a, is the second largest uh, real estate company in the world. So currently, I'm a full-time academic staff in UNSW uh, and you can see my other hobbies as well on the screen. Okay, so now let's start with the core of the presentation. So why health and safety in construction? I think many of you should be should know already the, the reasons why we implement health and safety. So good safety practices, we can avoid costs associated with accidents. So actually in Australia, we have conducted research and we, we, we proved already that investment in safety to prevent accidents, obviously, is actually cheaper than allowing accidents to happen. So it's, it's proven in the context of Australia. So therefore, uh, investing in safety is actually a wise, uh, a wise thing to do uh, in, in the economic sense. Good safety practices also can attract new clients and then it, it can influence our uh, 
uh, reputation as well by meeting moral obligations imposed by society. On the opposite side, lack of safety can increase the probability of accidents, which can cause human suffering, uh, which cannot be justified by any means. And accidents also can weaken the morale of people or in, on, on, on site, and this will affect their productivity and eventually will affect the bottom line of the project. And finally, lack of safety also can uh, cause prosecution and civil claim, which will increase project costs and uh, create adverse publicity. The first challenge I would like to introduce here is how about developing countries? I think we still need to conduct uh, research or so even uh, doing some business case uh, study concerning the economic uh, benefits of uh, safety. So when people or contractors, for example, in Indonesia, they uh, invest in health and safety. So what are the, the actual uh, benefits uh, from that, uh, that, that investment? Uh, can we uh, justify the investment economically? So I think something like this uh, still needs to be uh, studied further uh, in developing countries, including in Indonesia. A bit of snapshot concerning safety performance in the Australian construction industry. So last year in 2020, 170 Australian workers uh, died uh, at work. So this is all industrial sectors in Australia. 28 happened in the construction industry, 16%. This is the third highest number uh, among all industrial sectors in Australia. If we see the fatality rate, I think it tells the same story. Uh, the construction industry rate is uh, 2.0, which is the fourth highest in Australia while the industry average is 1.1. So therefore the, the rate in, in construction is almost double. The incidence rate, the serious claims per 1,000 workers, also the same, uh, the same performance. Construction is 16, which is the second highest, while the industry average is 9.3. Yes, we have improved our performance significantly in the Australian construction industry, but as you can see from the statistics, uh, we still can uh, improve uh, further. I think that's the main uh, message from the condition in the Australian construction industry. So now let's see how health and safety has progressed over the, over the years or even over the centuries. If you can see here, health and safety is not something new. Uh, it, it's it's available already in the Code of Hammurabi, which was released in 1760 BC. So it's like, what, 3,700 years ago. So it was proclaimed by King Hammurabi, the king of Babylon, uh, who reigned from that one, 1790 to, uh, to 1750 BC. So one of the clauses in the Code of Hammurabi says, if a builder builds a house for someone and does not construct it properly, and the house which he built falls in and kills its owner, then that builder shall be put to death. So, I mean, health and safety actually has been considered many centuries, so even many millennia ago. So, it's not something uh, new. In a more contemporary age, uh, the evolution of safety can be classified into three ages. The first one is the age of technology. So it started in 1769 during the Industrial uh, Revolution. During this period, the main threat to safety, so the problem of safety in this period is machine or technology. They tended to use uh, steam engines and uh, that the machine uh, tended to blow up uh, at that time. So the machine, is the problem according to people at that time. So in order to solve the problem, they conducted reliability analysis. They tried to find the sources of the problem in the technology or in the machine. So their goal is to make machines more reliable. So if the technology reliable, then people will be safe. So that's the principle behind the first age, which is the age of technology. Then 
after many years, uh, people focus on, on technology to improve health and safety. After a lot of developments, this major accident happened. So the Three Mile Island accident. This is a partial meltdown of a nuclear reactor in the US, Pennsylvania in 1979. So if you can see the description here, the pipe pumped water into the second reactor to prevent it from overheating, stopped working. As a result, the reactor core uh, boiled. And somehow the plant operators made the situation even worse by stopping further water uh, from flowing to the reactor. So therefore the reactor kept overheating. Actually in this situation, uh, water should be allowed uh, to flow uh, to cool down the, uh, the core. Uh, as a result, there was a state of emergency evacuation order. The residents obviously panic uh, and small amounts of radiation were released. The process of cleaning up uh, took 14 years and the cost 1 billion US dollars, the worst nuclear disaster in US history. So after this accident, people started thinking, well, what happened? I thought technology has become uh, reliable. So now we enter uh, the second age of safety, which is the age of human factors. In this age, we have powerful technology, but somehow accidents continue to increase. And after some considerations, people thought, well, okay, now the problem is not technology anymore. The problem is the humans. So humans or people were seen as the weak link in system safety. Why? Because people, people are failure prone. They tend to make mistakes. They are unreliable. So what to do? How to solve this problem with humans? So the solution is there, is to replace humans whenever possible by using more technology, by using automation. When it is not possible to replace humans, then we need to minimize human variability as much as uh, possible. For example, by having rules, procedures, regulations, and we need to ensure people to follow them so we can control and minimize their variability. So that's the principle behind the second age, which is the age of human factors. Some examples of initiatives being implemented in the second uh, age, or as, as, as a result of the second age of safety is risk management. Again, I think you are familiar with the steps uh, of risk management. We have the first step to identify the hazards. Uh, we can do inspection, learn from past experiences. In the design stage, uh, we can uh, see the possible uh, hazards. We can consult the workers who will actually do the work they can review available information. The second step, as usual, we need to assess the, the risks. We need to understand how the hazards can cause harm. We also need to assess the uh, level of severity and the uh, likelihood. And then usually we will have the metrics so we can determine the level of uh, risk for, for a particular hazard. In Australia, uh, we have a set of activities which are considered as high risk activities. And for those uh, activities, we need to prepare safe work method statement. So this is in the construction industry in Australia. The third one, after we know the, the risk level, and we need to control them by implementing hierarchy of risk control, which I'll explain in the next uh, slide. So the purpose is to mitigate or reduce the level of risks. And the last step, maintaining and reviewing control measures. So after we implement the control measures, obviously we need to review them, making sure that they are effective in reducing the level of risks. So this is the hierarchy of risk control I mentioned uh, earlier. So there are six steps uh, here. So if you want to implement the risk control, uh, we need to start from the top one, because the top control is the best way to, uh, to, to, to mitigate uh, risk. Uh, the first one, elimination, uh, obviously we need to elim eliminate the, the risks whenever possible. In the construction industry, for example, 
instead of allowing the workers uh, to work at height, uh, we can use pre application for example. So the work can be done in a factory, and then the components can be uh, brought on site and then installed uh, in the building. Or we can do the work in the ground floor first before, again, the component being placed in the, uh, in the building. So this is an example of eliminating the risk of falling from height. If that one is not possible, then the second level is substitution. So we want to substitute the risk or substitute the hazard with a safer alternative. For example, on site, if we have an old defective equipment, then we can get a new equipment, which is safer. Instead of using lead paint, for example, then we can use acrylic paint, which is again safer for the workers. So that's the second uh, risk control. The third one is isolation. So we want to isolate people uh, from the hazard. A simple example is installing guard rail uh, in, in, our, in our project, As, uh, say, uh, if the project is a high-rise building, then installing the guard, guard rail to prevent people from falling from height. So that's an example of isolation. Another example, if we have a moving vehicle uh, on site, then we can separate the vehicle from uh, the footpath of people or workers. So again, we want to isolate the hazards. If that is not possible, then we need to go a step below, which is engineering control. Engineering control is like physical uh, control to minimize uh, hazards or, or mini, uh, reduce the level of risks. If I can give you an example, uh, say if we need to work uh, in the basement or a confined space, then we can have proper ventilation to make sure the air uh, in the workplace is fresh. We can provide adequate uh, lighting uh, as well, so it's safer. Uh, instead of manual handling, we can use uh, some automation to reduce uh, manual handling. So this is an example of engineering control. And then another lower risk control is administrative control. So this is about procedures, about rules uh, to constrain the behavior of uh, people. For example, we can have warning signs on site to remind the workers to work safely. We can have inductions and trainings for uh, the workers so they know how to uh, work safely. We can have job rotation, for example, so the workers uh, can work only for a certain number of hours per day before uh, they have to be replaced by the next uh, crew in the next uh, shift. Uh, again, that's another example of administrative control. And finally, the last one and the least preferred method is the uh, PPE. So asking uh, workers to simply wear PPE and uh, work safely. So this is the least preferred method because it does not change the hazard at all. So the hazard is still there. We just simply ask the workers to work safely by wearing PPE. The challenges here, most projects in developing countries are in the levels of administrative control and PPE. I think we need to consider how we can uh, use higher level of uh, risk control in order to reduce the level of risks. So another way, remember, we are, we are still in the second age of safety, which is about uh, constraining the uh, variability of human. One way to do so is by motivating them. So motivation is the arousal, direction, and persistence of behavior. As managers, we need to understand the needs of the workers. Uh, we need to know why they behave in a certain way to fulfill their needs. And then finally, after behaving in a certain way, they will get something uh, rewards for their behavior. And obviously the reward is to fulfill uh, their needs. So we need to know what they need. We need to have uh, rewards which are valued by uh, the people, so then we can form their uh, behavior uh, so they can, that they are willing to work safely to get the rewards, which will satisfy uh, their needs. I think this is the basic principle behind uh, motivation and one way uh, for us to control uh, human variability. 
after all the efforts, okay, focusing on technology and then focusing on human, this one happened, the Chernobyl disaster in April 1986 in Chernobyl, at that time in Soviet Union. This is the worst disaster in the history of nuclear power generation. So there were explosions which caused the release of large amounts of radioactive material spreading across Europe. Uh, the impacts were very significant. 300,000 people were evacuated, 54 direct uh, deaths. And then over the years, there are many indirect deaths uh, as well yeah, because of cancer uh, diseases and so on. The economic damage was estimated to be uh, $235 billion. And after many investigations, they found that for design and BKS procedures, scientific training, violation of rules, pressure, a lot of things which contributed uh, to the accident. So in a sense, in summary, uh, they are beyond technical and human errors. So they concluded that the accidents was caused by a lack of safety culture. And just a note that the Challenger disaster, the, the rocket right, bringing astronaut, uh, also occurred in the same year. So because of those two accidents, uh, people considered again, okay, the technology is reliable. We have focused or tried to improve or, or minimize human variability, but major accidents still happen. We need to do more. So therefore now we have the third age of safety, which is the age of safety management. Human error and technical failures are seen as consequences. The problem is, on the organization. That is a source of the problem. Poor safety culture, poor leadership are the sources of uh, accidents in the workplace, including in the construction industry. So what should we do? We have to integrate health and safety into daily operation of the companies. So we need to integrate the organization, we need to integrate the technology and the human as well, so we can improve health and safety performance in the construction industry. So that's the principle behind the age of safety management. So now what is safety culture? You, you can see the definition there, the product of individual and group values, attitudes, perceptions, competencies, and patterns of behavior that can determine the commitment to and the style and proficiency of an organization's health and safety management system. The definition is a bit long, a bit complex, a bit difficult to understand, I suppose. But if you see the manifestations or the dimensions of safety culture, the three aspects there, it will be easier to understand the concept of safety culture. So we have the psychological aspects. This is about how people feel. Sometimes uh, this aspect is called safety climate as well. So this is about people's feeling concerning health and safety, people's perceptions and people's attitudes concerning health and safety. The second manifestation is the behavioral aspects. Obviously, this is what people do. So how people behave in a workplace, whether they are willing to follow safety procedures, for example, whether they are behaving safely or not. And the third one, situational aspects, this is what the organization has. Essentially, this is about safety management system in the organization. So policies, procedures, regulations, structures, support, and so on. So these three dimensions express safety culture in a company. Let's see quickly one by one, psychological aspect uh, or safety climate, which is one dimension of safety culture. So there are many studies concerning safety climate uh, out there. So I'll just give one uh, example here. Uh, remember, safety climate is about people's feeling, uh, people's perceptions and attitudes towards safety in the organization or in their workplace. Safety climate itself can be manifested by uh, different uh, factors. Uh, these factors uh, on the slide are just uh, examples. The famous one is management commitment, right? The, the workers or the people, they should perceive that the managers are committed to safety. 
And then the second one, safety communication, uh, safety rules and procedures, making sure they are uh, uh, practical and also enforced in the workplace. Personal accountability, so everyone has to be involved uh, when it comes to health and safety. And then the last one, safety training. Again, it should be uh, practical uh, and, and should be uh, uh, measured uh, in the workplace. So those are just examples of the manifestations of safety climate. So how people feel, how people perceive concerning these factors in the workplace. So I conducted research concerning safety climate uh, in the construction industry, uh, obviously. So I collected data from managers and also from supervisors. So there you can see the uh, dimension of safety climate, which I uh, assessed in the research. Interestingly, safety climate as perceived by managers are actually significantly higher than uh, the safety climate level as perceived by the supervisors. So the managers, uh, the managers uh, felt, okay, health and safety in my company is actually not so bad, but the supervisors didn't think so. So the supervisors felt that uh, health and safety level is actually not that high. So there is a different uh, perceptions between uh, those in the managerial level and those at the supervisory level. Interestingly, this problem, the misalignment in safety climate, so this is another challenge I would like to put forward here. It, it, it happens everywhere, not only in Australia, but also in, if you can see here in Iran, it happened in Thailand, in Hong Kong, and also in Taiwan. So when implementing health and safety, the management always perceive, okay, health and safety in my company is not so bad. But then when we measure at the supervisor's level, there is a misalignment. Usually the level is lower. When we assess at the worker's level, the level is even lower than the level at the supervisor's uh, level. So I guess another challenge today is how can we uh, reduce uh, this misalignment between uh, different levels in the uh, company, how we can change the perceptions of our workers, how we can support our supervisors so they more uh, appreciate uh, concerning health and safety in the workplace. The second aspect of safety culture is the behavioral aspect. I think this uh, dimension or manifestation is quite uh, clear. Uh, here, I'll just give you an example of, of the relationship between uh, the previous aspect, which is the safety climate and the behavioral uh, aspect. So safety climate, remember, is about job attitude. So if the attitudes are like what uh, is shown on the screen, so maybe a worker feels okay, safety rules and procedures actually interfere with my production. Uh, it, it makes me slower in doing my work. So this kind of attitude will uh, or may uh, become uh, an intention. So the intention of the worker is to ignore safety rules and procedures. And there is an intention uh, to take unnecessary risks as well. And then from there, eventually, the intention can become actual behavior. So the worker uh, fails to follow safety rules and procedures, and the worker performs uh, risk-taking behavior. Uh, I think this is just a simple example to show the interrelationship between the dimensions of safety culture. And finally, the last one, we have the situational aspect of what the organization has. Uh, remember, this is about safety management system in the, uh, in the company. This is just a simple uh, process of safety uh, management system, uh, which can be implemented in any organization. So the first one, they need to have a safety policy, which will govern health and safety implementation in the company. And then the second step is organizing. So they need to organize their resources uh, to manage health and safety, both human resources, uh, uh, budget, uh, and also tools and equipment uh, to support health and safety implementation. And then after organizing, the next step is planning and implementing. So planning, usually they need to conduct uh, risk management analysis. Uh, they need to decide on the, uh, the risk control. Remember the hierarchy of risk control in order uh, to minimize the risk. 
And finally, they need to implement uh, the, the, the plan. And then the next one, we have uh, measuring. So again, the same process, we need to measure uh, the risk control uh, to find out whether they are effective uh, or not to reduce the level of risk. And finally, the last one, uh, reviewing. So we need to, again, reviewing the entire process, especially at the end of the uh, project uh, to get the lessons learned uh, and again, to improve the performance in further uh, projects. And we have another step here, which is auditing, can be internal and can be external uh, auditing process, just to audit the entire uh, process from another or a fresh uh, perspective to ensure that the safety management system is still relevant, uh, that it still meets the requirements of the uh, legislation uh, as well. So that is the situational aspect of safety culture. So from there, from safety culture, I want to introduce a new topic, which is fairly new, uh, even in, in the Australian construction industry. So it's mental health in construction. Not many people realize the seriousness of mental health in construction. So if you see here, most health and safety research focuses on physical injuries and health issues. Mental health or psychological injuries, they tend to be ignored or neglected because they are invisible and silent. But if we see the statistics, so these are suicide statistics in Australia, about 75% of people who take their own lives are men. So now we know that men are actually more vulnerable when it comes to mental health problem. This is in Australia, okay. Construction workers have suicide rates 84% higher than non-construction workers. Construction workers are very vulnerable when it comes to mental health problems. Construction workers six times more likely to die by suicide than in workplace accidents. So mental health problems are more serious than the usual physical uh, workplace accidents. And then again, suicide rates among workers aged 15 to 24 are more than twice as high as other males in that age bracket. So this is another uh, factor uh, uh, which we need to pay attention on. So young people or young men uh, actually are more vulnerable than the other age uh, group. And finally, the last one, people working in lower skilled jobs are more at risk. For the tradespeople, the laborers on site, they are more at risk than those at the management levels. So now we, need, we, we know the, the risk factors of mental health in construction. So basically men, younger age, and those uh, working in lower skilled jobs as tradespeople, and also uh, yeah, as tradespeople and laborers uh, on site. So once we know the risk factors, we can provide intervention strategies. We can provide support uh, for them so they can manage their mental health uh, problems. I conducted research as well concerning mental health in construction. So my colleague and I tried to identify stresses in the construction industry. So what factors uh, which cause uh, people uh, or professionals in the construction industry to feel stressful and eventually uh, get depressed or get anxiety and get uh, acute stress conditions. So we identified many factors and after conducting the research, we found these four common uh, uh, factors or stresses. I think if you can see here, those factors are very common in the construction industry anywhere uh, in the world. So nature of work, so working on site is a dangerous place. Sometimes it's far away from uh, families uh, and so on. So the nature of work is uh, a key stressor. And then the second one, we have time uh, pressure, which is again, uh, a common uh, occurrence in the construction industry. It's always deadline after deadline and this time pressure can be a significant stressor. Workload, uh, the same thing which is related with time uh, pressure as well. 
And, and finally, long hours. So people in the construction industry, they tend to work longer hours than uh, people in other industries. And I know, well, at least a few years ago, I know the condition in Indonesia is quite not so good in terms of working long hours in the construction industry. And this can have a serious impact on uh, the mental health of people uh, in the industry. Uh, we did another research as well on work-life balance in the in the Australian construction industry. So obviously the work-life balance is poor. And what is the source of this poor work-life balance? Uh, we found long work hours again as a, as a contributor. Uh, and then the second one, we have the stress experienced by people working in construction, again, because of the time pressure, the workload, the demand and so on. And interestingly, technology also can contribute uh, to poor work-life balance. So we have, in a sense, a concept that technology can improve work-life balance because it provides flexibility to people. That's not wrong. But at the same time, technology can worsen work-life balance because nowadays it's very easy to reach people by just using email 24 hours a day or even using mobile phone 24 hours per day. And this kind of technology actually can worsen uh, work-life uh, balance. So we need to be aware of these sources of uh, problems. So the challenge today, uh, how to address mental health uh, issues. So this is a big challenge in the Australian construction industry. Probably in developing countries, uh, less focus uh, is given uh, to this uh, problem of mental health issues. But I think it's important for people to be aware of the seriousness of the issue and how they can uh, contribute uh, to people's productivity and performance. And at the end, uh, will impact on the performance of the uh, project. So these are just some uh, ways that have been uh, done in Australia to address mental health uh, issues. In a sense, they are still relatively uh, uh, new uh, approaches uh, and we are still learning as well from uh, the process. So first we need to reduce stigma. So we need to accept the reality. Mental health is a real issue in the workplace. So we should not uh, neglect them. We should not ignore them, but we need to acknowledge the, the reality so if someone is suffering from mental health issues, then we need to provide support uh, rather than condemning them. Increasing awareness, again, the same thing. We need to make people aware concerning the seriousness of mental health issues, making a, a real commitment, firm commitment to improve mental health by implementing certain uh, initiatives, for example, to increase uh, flexibility in the workplace to ensure that uh, people can work in a, uh, in a reasonable budget, for example, and a reasonable time frame uh, with reasonable workload. We need to support uh, employees. Uh, one in four uh, in Australia have experienced depression or anxiety. So there must be an avenue for uh, the employees to, uh, to seek help when they uh, experience depression or anxiety building skills and confidence. So we need to teach or train people how to cope, or to implement coping strategies when they are stressful. And finally, education on workplace bullying, because bullying can tend to lead uh, to health, uh, mental health uh, issues. Okay, so from mental health problem, from safety culture, now we shifted our paradigm to uh, more technology-related uh, uh, initiatives uh, to improve health uh, and safety. So the first one, which I would like to introduce, is prefabrication. So I'm I'm excited actually with prefabrication. Uh, it's growing in Australia, uh, although it's slow, but it's really big in Europe, especially in Scandinavian countries like Denmark and Sweden. So an example is this project in in Australia, the Plamo houses in Melbourne by Murfac. So Murfac is the contractor. So Murfac developed uh, eight townhouses, four townhouses, 
were built using the traditional method and another four were built using prefabrication. And then they, they wanted to compare the performance of the, uh, the four houses and another four houses. So here we can see the comparison between the traditional approach and the prefabrication approach and the outcome as well. The overall program for the traditional 29 weeks, prefab 22 weeks, so seven weeks uh, less or 23% faster. The floor structure, so to build the floor, the ground floor slab of the townhouses, traditional 12 hours, prefab only one hour. The labor hours on site, traditional more than 8,000, prefab only slightly more than 7,000, so 11% less labor hours. The high risk work, so this is about health and safety. Traditional 12 weeks of high risk work, especially the, the work uh, involved in uh, using scaffolding, while prefab only seven weeks. So it means five weeks less of scaffold, uh, scaffold work, which is 42% less. So in a sense, we can say already, it is actually safer when we use prefab uh, approach. The same thing again in terms of health and safety, manual handling for traditional, a lot of manual handling for cladding, for floor, for walls, prefab, nothing. So all lifted by crane. 2,100 less lifts by workers to install 42 tons of material. At the same time, it creates more equitable workplace as well because the construction industry is a male dominated industry. Some people say we need men strength to work in the construction industry, especially when we do it on site. But when we use prefab, we use automation and everything is being done in a factory. Remember, prefabrication is about uh, building the components in a factory, right? And then transporting the big components on site to be installed uh, in the building. So, my apology. So this can create a more equitable workplace because it, it doesn't depend on, on actual uh, strength, right? So men and women can have a more equitable workplace when we implement prefabrication. The impact on community is good as well. So six, six weeks of traffic uh, were eliminated for the neighbors. 112 less worker cars. On-site waste, uh, again, 180 uh, cubic meters and 90 uh, cubic meters. So about 50% less waste. And finally, the quality in terms of air tightness of the uh, building. So traditional is eight uh, air changes per hour. Uh, prefab is five. So it means the, the, the buildings in terms of its uh, insulation, in a sense, uh, is better, performs uh, better. So therefore, uh, it requires less uh, cooling in summer and less heating in winter. Another example of prefabrication is the use of bathroom pots. So you see, this is the factory by the sink uh, industries. So this factory produces bathroom pots. So, so basically the entire bathroom is produced inside these boxes. And then the boxes uh, are brought uh, on site, as you can see here, uh, and then it can be placed uh, into the building using a uh, tower crane. And that's the inside of the bathroom pot. So, I mean, by using bathroom pots doesn't mean that it look uh, ugly, but as you can see in the picture there, actually the final product uh, looks quite nice and it can be easily uh, modified uh, as well in the factory. Now we compare the use of bathroom pots uh, and traditional uh, method of constructing bathrooms. In traditional approach, these are the subcontractors or the tradespeople that we need to contact in the process. The plumber, electrician, plasterer, joiner, glazier, waterproofer, tiler, tile supplier, and fixture supplier, a lot of uh, stakeholders, so a lot of uh, people that have to be contacted. And then the process is not that simple either. We need to have tender for each uh, person or each tradesperson or each subcontractor. And then we need to get purchase order for each 
the coordination can be quite lengthy as well. Then each of them has to be inducted in terms of health and safety, and then their performance has to be managed as well uh, in terms of time cost quality and also health and safety. And finally, they have warranty to be, uh, to be managed. So there is another case study also by Murfak. So, so to complete 26 homes using traditional approach, they need 460 notifications, 61 hours of phone calls, 930 emails, 130 hours of meetings and 360 hours of things. So now let's compare with bathroom pods. So here is the comparison in terms of scheduling. Remember earlier, traditional 460 notifications for prefab only 104. So 78% reduction. In terms of phone calls, 61 hours, prefab only 15 hours, 75% reduction. Emails, 930 hours for the bathroom pods, only 52 hours, 94% reduction. Meetings, the same thing, 130 hours, and this one only 78 hours, 40%. Inspections, 360 hours and 140, 71% reduction. Man hours, the same story, significantly reduced, 88% reduction. And days in construction, 109, and only seven days for the bathroom uh, box. So obviously, when we work on site in a fewer number of days, this will improve health and safety significantly. So here we can see the, the benefits of using prefabrication to improve health and safety on site. But we have challenges to implement prefabrication. As usual, people are difficult to change. So resistance to change is, is always the biggest hurdle to implement prefabrication. Uh, if it doesn't break, then why we need to change? That's always the concept of people. And then prefabrication also will have higher initial costs because it requires more planning. It will require a new skill set for workers as well to install big uh, components on site. And some tradespeople in Australia are not happy with the new method of work because they, they have been doing the work for decades and then now we ask them uh, to change. So it's a bit difficult to, uh, to motivate them uh, to change. And, and I mean, the tradespeople in Australia, remember, is quite powerful. Uh, and then there is negative perceptions as well. So this is uh, from the client side because they have negative perceptions toward uh, prefabrication. They feel that prefabrication means lower quality because it's being mass produced. And then prefabrication uh, buildings or houses, they all uh, look uh, the same. So this is another uh, negative uh, perception. So the client themselves are not happy with prefab. Manufacturer capability is another problem in Australia. So not many uh, manufacturers are actually able to produce a big prefabrication components for the construction industry. And finally, it requires support from large players to change the culture in the construction industry. If you have time later on, if you can watch uh, this video, I think it's a very interesting uh, video to see the process of prefabrication in uh, Europe. Another technology today which can improve health and safety is drone uh, technology. So especially using drones to, to do a survey in the, in the, on construction sites. So why drone technology? It is fast, reproducible, uh, on-demand image acquisition. So if we use manual survey and we want to know the progress of a project, for example, on daily basis, it's, it's impossible. So it's impossible to conduct daily survey to capture in detail what has been done on site. So when we use drone, we can immediately uh, capture the progress uh, on site. So it's very easy to reproduce the data on daily basis or based on the 
uh, needs uh, on site. It's accurate and, uh, uh, and, and produce comprehensive uh, data uh, as well. Remember, if you use manual survey using, you know, the, the massive thick uh, ruler, ruler usually, we only can do it in a certain spots, right? We can't do it in, in many uh, places. Otherwise, it will be very time consuming. By using drone technology, we can capture a lot of points uh, on site. So therefore, the data will be more comprehensive and should be more accurate as well. As a result, uh, this method will be better in terms of cost and uh, time uh, as well. So cheaper and also faster to do the survey. It can lead to better documentation. So I have one case, uh, like a long road uh, project. Then the, I think the client would like to know, hey, I want to know the location of that manhole. Rather than sending a person to go there and then measure uh, the, the, the location of the manhole, we can just simply use the drone or the data or, or data from the from the drone to actually find out where the exact location of the manhole. When the, the, the road is like hundreds of kilometers long, obviously it will be difficult to do it manually. But when we have drone technology, it will be very easy for us to find where that particular item is located. Remote access to current status uh, of the site. So rather than for a manager to come on site and in inspect the work, uh, the drone can actually do it for the managers. And all those things will lead to better health and safety. Right? Rather than doing inspection manually, for example, if we have Haras building, we want to inspect the facade of the building. Rather than climbing the building, which is obviously health and safety risk, we can just simply ask the drone to do it for us. So therefore, uh, using drone technology, uh, this can uh, lead uh, to better health uh, and safety. So another relatively new technology is wearable technologies to improve health and safety. For example, like e uh, smart hard hat, uh, we can use smart uh, watch, uh, what else, a smart vest, and even smart uh, boots uh, as well. So why wearable technologies? We can use them uh, to monitor uh, these uh, categories. And you can see the relationship between the category and the hazards as well, and the indicators which will be captured by the wearable technology. So we can use physiological monitoring, safety hazards, sleep, trips and falls, the health as a stress, heat, cold, strain, injuries experienced by the worker. So how we can measure them? So these are the indicators, the heart rate of the workers, the respiratory rate, uh, the body posture, body speed, and so on. So we know the physiological conditions of the workers. So if something is outside the acceptable range, then we can immediately notice the workers, for example, or even the workers can can be informed by the device directly that something is not right with their physiological condition. Environmental sensing, the same thing, slips, trips, fire, and explosions. The health hazards, for example, the chemicals like asbestos, uh, noise, heat, uh, cold. The indicators, so we can measure the ambient temperature. So when it's too hot, for example, and we can ask the workers to okay, stop uh, work. Uh, the ambient pressure at the uh, workplace, the humidity, the noise level, whether it's acceptable or not, the light intensity, whether it's bright enough or not, and also the air quality. So we can, the workers can get notified immediately when something goes wrong. Proximity detection for caught in or, or in between, uh, struck by, uh, usually by moving vehicles and electrofusion. Now, the same thing, the health hazards here, and you can see the indicators or so the object uh, detection. So when we have uh, this kind of variable technology in our workers, and the same thing as well, we can monitor the movement of uh, our vehicles, for example. So when they come close together, then the workers can be notified, hey, be careful, there is a moving vehicle around you. And finally, location tracking, you can see again the safety hazards and the health hazards as well. The indicators we know where our workers is uh, located, where the materials uh, are located, where the vehicles and equipments are uh, located. 
So in the case of emergency, for example, we, we know for sure whether we have uh, all the workers uh, have been evacuated or not. So those are just some, uh, some examples of the implementation or, or the application of wearable technologies to improve health and safety. The last one, the digital uh, twin. So you can see the definition there, a digital model of a particular physical element or a process with data connections that enable convergence between the physical and virtual states at an appropriate state, state rate of synchronization. Very complicated definition in, in a simple word. Basically, digital twin is to create a digital representation of uh, the real uh, environment. So if you have a building, then you, you should be able to create the accurate digital representation of the building. And it's even further than that. If possible, we need to know the movement inside the building as well. How many people inside the building, where they are located, uh, the, the use of electricity inside the building. When somebody turn on the light, for example, inside the building, the digital twin should be able to reflect uh, it. So basically, the digital twin will reflect the actual condition of the building. The application of digital twin, we are still learning in the uh, process, but some of the applications here, we can control equipment remotely, which is, can be better in terms of health and safety. So rather than asking an operator or a worker uh, to control equipment directly in a remote places, we can control the equipment, say an excavator, for example, uh, from far uh, away. So then what happens in the, uh, Whatever the equipment does, it will be reflected by the digital twin uh, equivalent, uh, which can be controlled by the, the operator. Facilities management in intelligent buildings, so like what I said uh, earlier, uh, the building should be able to reflect the actual uh, condition. So when a light uh, turns on, it should be detected as well in the digital twin. And as a result, we can control uh, the, the performance of the building uh, better. Simulate training exercises virtually, so rather than using actual equipment, which can be quite dangerous, we can simulate the, the training equipment uh, using digital uh, twin. So therefore, we can train people uh, using simulations uh, instead. And then data visualization and communication, so this is the, the same. So when we can capture uh, what is happening in a building, for example, or in a, in a project, we know the movement of the workers, we know the location of the, the materials, the equipment, and so on. Then we can use the technology uh, to communicate the progress of the project uh, to lay people or to the community, which will be easier uh, for them uh, to understand. So that is the potential application of digital uh, twin. So if I can just show a quick video, uh, I hope it works. Let me try. So this is the real application of digital uh, twin, which was used in Amazon Go store. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store grab what you want, and just go. What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it just walk out technology. 
Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app, and you can keep going. Amazon Go. No lines, no checkout. No, seriously. So that's the last slide for my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for uh, listening. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Riza, for your presentation. Yes. Uh, we really appreciate your uh, presentation. It's very, very good. Uh, I think we uh, will get a lot uh, from you. And then uh, to the next uh, point, we will go to the session for our panelists, uh, which is uh, our lecturers from our Faculty of Public Health. Uh, there is uh, one question from uh, Bapak Dr. Zulkifli Junaidi. Maybe Pak uh, Zulkifli, uh, can you uh, ask your question directly to Dr. Riza or open your video? Time is here, Pak Zulkifli. Okay. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Dr. Riza, uh, we appreciate about your presentation. It's very, very useful for us here in Indonesia. Uh, I want to ask you uh, one question about, uh, as we know, we have uh, two principles of uh, safety. That's, uh, the first one is uh, work safety, and the second one is uh, safety of work. Work safety, it means uh, the safety becomes a priority in the work, uh, working operation process. So uh, uh, every step of a working process should, uh, should be done uh, according to the safety uh, principles or safety procedures. Yeah? Yep. That's the second one, that's the first one. And the second one about the safety of work. The safety of work is uh, safety becomes uh, an integral part of the, uh, of the working process, the working process. So, uh, the function of safety in this, in this uh, second principles is uh, to save or to protect all the pace of work. Uh, so uh, it, it, uh, it will do in, uh, in a safe, uh, uh, safe procedures, something like that. So uh, I want uh, to know about your opinion, which one, uh, uh, which one is best for a construction industry? Uh, that's my question. Thank you, Dr. Riva. Thank you for the question. Uh, maybe I can answer directly then, Pak Mufti. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting perspective. We have work safety and then we have safety of work. For me personally, I think we need both because in a sense, these principles are about top-down approach and also bottom-up approach. So yes, uh, people, in management, they need to demonstrate their commitment towards safety. Uh, they need to have proper policy procedures. They need to provide the budget. They need to provide the resources to manage health and safety. That's fine. That's correct. We need to be able to work safety. But at the same time, we need to have the bottom-up approach as well. So management commitment without the support from the people in the bottom like what I said earlier, there is a misalignment between uh, safety climate at the higher level and at the lower level. So without the support from the bottom, safety will not be optimum uh, either. So how we can, uh, in a sense, encourage uh, the, the employees, encourage the workers to embrace uh, health and safety is also a very important uh, factor uh, to, to, to ensure health and safety in the workplace. So I think for me, we do need both uh, uh, principles, uh, the, the top down and also the bottom up, if you want uh, safety to be effective in the workplace. Okay, Pazu, do you have any further question? Maybe? No question anymore. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, uh, we'll uh, we still open uh, the session for our panelists, maybe other panelists from uh, University of Indonesia. If you have any question, please uh, raise a hand in the column of chat, or maybe you can open your video and ask the question. Okay, I think uh, no more question from our panelists. Maybe we can go to our attendees. Uh, here we have uh, our alumni, uh, Dr. Riza. Yeah, she's working in the government. So I would like to introduce uh, Mbak Raydira. Uh, maybe Mas Abdul Qadir can help to uh, make Mbak Raydira uh, open the video and ask question directly to Dr. Riza. Sure. Maybe Ms. Raydra, you can ask directly because the microphone is open. Okay. Can you hear my voice clearly? Yes. Hello? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for the mature explanation from Dr. Riza and the opportunity for me to ask. Um, my question is, as we know, when employer want to implement automation and technology to change human role in work, uh, it's going to raise negative or even positive perspective, uh, perceptions from labor union due yep. to low employment opportunity for job seeker, right? Uh, yep. Uh, I want to ask for your opinion. What's your strategy to ensure or persuade them that they don't need to worry about uh, that so we can implement uh, the automation in our corporate? Meanwhile, in this condition, Indonesian government still attempt to empower job seekers through vocational and technical training to fulfill the need of skill from company, just like training for welder, operator, and etc. Uh, so how you ensure uh, or persuade them? Thank you. Thank you for the question. That's a that's a very good question because it happened here as well in Australia. So it's very difficult to convince the, the tradespeople and the workers to change their uh, behavior uh, or their method of work, like what you described, their concern with their employability. Uh, it's not an easy way to do, but I mean, the construction industry is a massive uh, industry. Even when we implement prefabrication, uh, let's be real, there are still many elements which still have to be done uh, manually, in a sense. And the construction industry around the world is experiencing labor shortage. Uh, I'm, I'm sure in Indonesia, uh, you also have the same uh, difficulties. So I think yeah, I don't think by implementing automation and prefabrication, uh, this will actually make people uh, lose their jobs because the industry is big. There are still many opportunities out there and our technology is still far away from being perfect. So we still need people to do some types of work on site. And at the same time, by using prefabrication, for example, we, we also can retrain uh, our workers. So for example, instead of working on site, they actually can work in a factory. And by working in a factory, their health and safety is actually better. So we need to, I guess, educate the people. And at the same time, we need to show them that there are many avenues that they can do uh, to upskill uh, themselves. And there are many opportunities uh, in the future when we implement uh, such uh, technology to improve performance. I think that's my my view on this one. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Riza. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mbak Redira. Uh, if you have any other question, please put in the question and answer column. Okay. Uh, uh, next, maybe last one for the uh, interactive or uh, directly question to uh, Dr. Riza. Uh, we have here, uh, 
I don't know, this is Mas or Bapak Naufal from University of North Sumatra. Maybe if uh, Pak Naufal uh, can hear me, uh, you can prepare to directly ask your question to Dr. Riza. I think uh, this is uh, one of the good questions related to the cost of safety. Pak Naufal? Yes. Yeah. Uh, please ask your question to Dr. Riza directly. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, you mentioned before that investing in safety is cheaper than the cost that associated with the accidents uh, in Australia. Yep. Uh, from the uh, research that you conducted, uh, would you explain what kind of uh, safety investment that we can do or apply here, uh, here in the developing country uh, regarding prevention efforts? Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, yeah. Let's be honest. Uh, it's it's always it always come comes back to cost. So people always concern about cost. Uh, e even when it comes to health and safety, it's always about cost. So I guess for developing countries, uh, of course, we need to start somewhere. We need to start from something uh, simple. By by something simple by for example by just wearing PPE. I've been to many sites in Indonesia. I'm, I'm talking about big sites. So just a simple thing of wearing PPE is still, again, if I can be honest, is still lacking uh, in Indonesia. So if, if this simple thing cannot be enforced, then it will be difficult uh, to invest in uh, other things to uh, improve health and safety. So I think we need to do it in a, in a step-by-step -step, uh, way. Uh, if I can give another example, guardrails. I think that's a simple safety implementation in, in, in the workplace. So I went to, uh, to a site in Indonesia uh, just a few years ago, I think three years ago. It's a Haras building site being done by a big contractor. No guardrail whatsoever. So again, just a simple thing like this, uh, the simple safety uh, investment. Uh, I think we need to start from uh, these uh, simple things before we can uh, try to improve health and safety uh, performance uh, progressively. Uh, that's my, my view on, on this one. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Riza. Uh, Bapak Naufal, maybe yes. you have uh, respond? Yes, yes. Is it answer your question? Of course, it's answer my question. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you. Uh, Dr. Riza, uh, we move to the next uh, person. Uh, there is uh, Miss Fitri, yeah? Ibu Fitri Nugra ini. Uh, she asked question about uh, from University Islam Indonesia. She asked about, this is about the person in engineering and behavior. I think about a change in the behavior to perform safe work. Maybe Bu Fitri. Hello, Bu Fitri. Is there any? Yeah, hello. Hello, Bu Fitri. Yeah. yeah. Opportunity to ask your question directly to Dr. Riza. Okay, uh, Dr. Riza. Um... I have similar interest with you and also graduated from Australian University for Safety, Consultant Safety Op as well. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I, we, we all know that the construction worker uh, usually or often work unsafely in, in uh, Indonesia. Uh, quite hard to uh, educate them to uh, Make them realize that their, saf their safety is the uh, their uh, right in, in in construction. So how to change them to change their, their mind uh, to be able to understand that the construct uh, the saf their safety is the is their right uh, in Indonesian country. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. The question. Uh, 
Yeah, this is also one of the main challenges. So people are always the, obviously the most difficult factor to be managed when it comes to health and uh, safety. M my view on this one, I think it really depends on the culture in the company as well. And it depends on the commitment of the uh, managers. To me, uh, I, I may be a bit naive here, uh, but I think if the managers are very strict when it comes to health and safety, uh, say for example, when an engineer or a staff or a worker doesn't work safely, then this person has to go out. I think that's a good way to demonstrate uh, or to give an example that the companies are actually serious in implementing health and safety. I mean, I saw again many instances on, on site when, when managers just simply ignore or pretend uh, that they don't see anything, even though some workers uh, behave uh, unsafely. So in a sense, this sending a message to the workers and to other employees that, well, if the managers be like that, so why should I care about health and safety? So in this case, uh, it's go back. Uh, it goes back to the commitment from the managers. If they are strict uh, when it comes to health and safety, if they are really serious, if they kick people out, for example, if they refuse to implement health and safety, I think slowly the culture also can be changed. Okay. Yeah, uh, I agree with you, Dr. Riza. Uh, sometimes I see that the project manager uh, act like a tough person and uh, do the their work unsafely. So yeah. if they become the, the role model of the construction worker, I think the... Uh... The workers will work unsafely as well. Thank you for your answer. No worries, thank you. Maybe just continuing a bit. I mean, if the project manager is like that, so it's a sign actually that the company also doesn't really care about uh, safety. I'm sure the top managers in the company are aware of the project manager's behavior. They just oh, yeah. choose to ignore it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you for your answer. Thank you, Ipu Petri. You too. Dr. Teresa, just, just some curiosity. Uh, is it mean that from your experience and your uh, research, uh, the role model and leaderships uh, bring the main factor to change the behavior? Yes, definitely. Uh, yeah, in Australia, because yeah, I guess because in Australia, the, the, the impact of poor health and safety is really serious for the, the company. Just a person, when this person falls on site because being tripped by something, can have a very serious consequence for the, the company. So I guess working in this kind of environment also uh, motivate the, the managers and the leaderships to focus more on health and safety. Okay, thank you. That's a good answer. Okay, so we still have uh, one a question. Uh, next is from uh, Ibu Reni Damayanti. Ibu Reni Damayanti, can you hear? Can you hear me, Ibu Reni Damayanti? Hello, Ibu Reni Damayanti. I think there is no response. Yeah, but uh, I think we can uh, uh, read the question of uh, Dr. Riza. The question is uh, in uh, Bahasa Indonesia, but uh, if you get the question, yeah, yeah. she asked okay. you your okay. question, uh, Dr. Riza, about the misalignment between the manager and the supervisor and uh, the next level below. Mm. So, so is it? Uh, is it uh, possible to do in Indonesia or just in uh, the default country like uh, Australia? And yeah. he also asked about the prefabrication. Uh, is it uh, become a solution in uh, Indonesia? Because we have a 
we are uh, the uh, developing country which uh, our concern is still about the uh, people yeah about the workers yeah okay please uh, your time to answer okay thank you for the question so i think the first one is about the misalignment right between safety climate uh, at the manager level and at the supervisor level is this applicable in indonesia as well or only happen in the in developed uh, countries uh, my research is obviously in australia but from my uh, presentation earlier uh, if you see i think the same condition also happens in developing countries uh, in iran uh, in thailand and also in thailand so i guess developing countries, I'm, I'm not sure in Indonesia because I haven't done any research in Indonesia in this regard, but I just have a feeling uh, probably it, it will be the same case. So somehow the, the level at the managerial level is always higher than the uh, level at the, at the lower uh, level. So therefore, again, we still need to close the gap and minimize the uh, misalignment. In terms of the pre-fabrication, I think this is a similar question like the previous one. If you use automation, then the union will not be happy. People will lose their job. So yeah, actually by using pre-fabrication, it's an opportunity to upskill uh, the, the workers. So instead of doing uh, the work uh, on site uh, as unskilled laborers, for example, then this is an opportunity to train them so they can upskill and work in a factory uh, as well by uh, doing a brief application. And as I said earlier, I mean, this is still very early in the, in the game. Uh, in, even though we are using brief application, but there are still many elements uh, on site which will need uh, the use of uh, workers uh, to do the, the work. So the, the impact uh, on the, on the uh, employability should not be significant. I think by upscaling the workers, actually, it will be better for them and it will be better for the uh, economy of the uh, country uh, as well. Because at the moment, many construction workers are still uh, informal workers. Usually, they come from uh, villages uh, during the non harvesting system uh, season. And then afterwards, they come back to their uh, places and do their things uh, again. So I think this is a, an opportunity to actually to actually formalize uh, these uh, workers to improve their uh, work conditions. Thank you for your answer, uh, uh, Riza. I want to ask about uh, regarding the upskilling uh, uh, skill the, the the workers, right? Um, maybe it's different. There is a different. I don't know. Based on your experience or maybe your research. Is there any different uh, method in the developed country or uh, in the developing country about upskilling the, the workers? Uh, because uh, when we talk about upskilling uh, the workers, sometimes uh, in our uh, mind, yeah, maybe in, in yeah in, in management mind, uh, it's always belong to the training. Uh, do you have any uh, suggestion or maybe uh, a solution? Is there any other method or, or maybe sharing from uh, uh, Australian? Maybe in Australia there is a, a new method or maybe to accelerate yeah, the, the, mm. the skill of workers. Okay. Not really. Actually, even in Australia, but I guess the system here is more uh, established because, say, to be a carpenter, for example, the, the the government requires them to complete certification uh, study before they can become car carpenter. Uh, the same for plumber, uh, the same for different tradespeople or like tukang basically in Indonesia. So I think that kind of system is still uh, lacking in Indonesia. So there is no, well, there is certification, but not many companies actually enforce it in the workplace. So in a sense, anyone can become carpenters, anyone can become the steel workers and so on. So slowly, I think the, the support from the government is uh, needed. Uh, so, 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 so certification is seen as, uh, as, as, well, not really compulsory yet, but something more appreciated in the workplace. So we can encourage uh, people to get the certification so they can be skilled. 
okay 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 thank you for your answer uh, we'll have time maybe i will open for the panelists if there is a question from panelists bapak ibu dari from uh, occupational health and safety department if you have any question okay no question maybe from from me again it's okay dr reza sure Yeah, I can I can be uh, interested in your uh, research with uh, our college in uh, occupational health and safety department about the psychological aspect and the safety climate, right? Yeah. Uh, some say that the safety climate is, uh, you know, uh, different from the uh, safety culture, but we can uh, see the 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 first part of safety culture is from the safety climate. Uh, what's your opinion about this and related to your research? Yeah, I, I, I agree on that one as well. So safety climate is just one manifestation of uh, safety culture because safety culture is a multi-dimension uh, construct and can be quite difficult to capture accurately uh, as well. So therefore, safety climate usually is used to to demonstrate the level of safety culture, but it's not really right in my view because it's only capturing a snapshot of uh, safety uh, culture. It's only about the feeling of people, the attitude of people, the, 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 the perception of people, but it doesn't capture the, the breadth uh, of safety uh, culture. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I think we are uh, in the end of the session. Uh, could you please, Dr. Riza, maybe uh, summarize uh, based on our theme, uh, what is the different, maybe, uh, the different uh, challenge or progress between the construction, because with the construction in Australia as a developed country and Indonesia, or maybe other developing country like Indonesia? Mm. Okay, just maybe a concluding uh, remark. I mean, health and safety has been a serious issue in the construction industry for uh, many years. Uh, yes, cost is always the main reason uh, why uh, companies, especially in developing countries, are not willing to implement health and safety. And then the use of traditional methods Uh, to choose contractors is also problematic because usually clients always choose the cheapest contractor uh, to do the work. So I think we need to start somewhere if you want to improve uh, health and safety in the uh, construction industry. We need to, can we actually ask ourselves, say, yes, maybe we get the work cheap, but then if we injure people, if we kill people along the way, we need to check with our consciousness. Do we want to get money more? But at the same time, we create a lot of suffering for other people, or do we want to do it in a right way? Uh, yeah, without commitment from the top, uh, without, well, also uh, strong leadership, it's really difficult to uh, implement uh, health uh, and safety. But yeah, we need to start uh, slowly. Uh, we can't just aim super high and then, okay, we want to use technology to improve health and safety. We want to do this with that. That's okay. That's the aspiration. But we need to start somewhere. We need to start slow. Start from the basic. And then once this one is, is done well, then we can start to tackle the, the bigger uh, issue. But yeah, I guess changing the mindset, uh, it starts from uh, ourselves. Uh, then from there, uh, we can slowly change the culture in the uh, industry. Uh, I think, yeah, that's, wanna, that's what I want to uh, conclude with at the moment. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Riza. I think strong point is from the word leadership, right? And the basic of mm. it, uh, because now we run a lot of uh, new technology, but uh, if we don't uh, 
yeah, if we don't do the the basic thing about uh, health and safety, such as leadership, yeah, I think technology is just a tool, maybe something like that, right? Mas Mukti, what, yeah. one last comment. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. but yes. Dr. Riza, do you yes. mind? Yeah, for to uh, for Dr. Riza, okay. uh, just just an information that I uh, I was. Uh, did my, my master of applied science in TFP in uh, also in the University of New South Wales in the year of 2000. Me and also Pak Chandra, I think, in our department. Yes, so we came from uh, same university. Okay. Uh, hello, Pak. Sama -sama. Uh, same <laughs> alumni from UNSW. <laughs> Okay, Pak pa Zulkifli, thank you for your comment. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, all the participants and panelists, uh, we are here now in the end of the session. I think uh, we have a good uh, a good presentation from Dr. Rita and also a good question from the attendees and also from the panelists. And I hope, uh, hopefully, uh, from this uh, seminar or webinar, uh, we can uh, get uh, something good from our uh, health and uh, safety area maybe uh, the research that uh, dr riza share we can uh, get uh, new knowledge yeah for the maybe academia and for the practitioner uh, maybe uh, you can uh, applicate in your uh, industry or your uh, company and uh, that's it uh, from today, uh, activity from um, Master of Occupational Health and Safety Department. And I would like to uh, give a big applause to Dr. Rida for your presentation and your answer. It's a very, very uh, good uh, session for us here in Indonesia. Uh, hopefully we can uh, yeah, see, uh, see you in uh, next time and get a, more, a lot of discussion uh, with you, hopefully. Thank you so much, Dr. Riza. So I uh, will uh, give back uh, to Mr. Abdul Qadir as the master of ceremony. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mufti, to moderate the presentation and discussion for today's morning. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of virtual general lecture event today, Thursday, 15th of April, 2021. And we would like to thank you for our speaker today, Dr. Riza Zosia Sunian Dijo. Our moderator, Mr. Mufti Wiraya Wirawan, as well as the parties that contributed to these events. And we also thank you for all participants that participate in this to this event. And we really we are really sorry for all participants who have asked questions, but there's no answer because the limitation of times. And we apologize for any inconvenience in today's session. As a reminder, don't forget to fulfill the attendance list in the column chart because we only consider those who submitted the form for the certificate purposes. And a certificate will be sent to each participant in accordance with the data during the registration, the maximum of six days after this event. And before I close, I would like to invite all panelists to take picture together. So for the all panelists, could you help to open your video, please? Okay, I will... Call it one, two, three. Once more. One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay, thus it is concluded that event today that organized by Master of Occupational Safety Department, Faculty of Public Health Universitas Indonesia. And don't forget to join us for the another session because we still have another session in the few days with another topics. And thank you for the Eluni Katiga and the Occupational Health Safety Community for the support. And thank you. Wabillahi Taufiq wal Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. See you next time. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Liza. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for having me as well. Yeah, bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Mansur. Thank you, Mansur.